Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, to, today, we will start with the um, computational uh, mechanics in specifically welding process. And we will specific to the topic the influence of the surface active elements and we will try to see the other uh, computational methods how to find out that uh, velocity field, temperature field and distortion residual stress that is associated with uh, mainly uh, fusion welding processes. So, uh, we have the theoretical knowledge or we know about the there is a influence of the surface active elements uh, during the welding process and normally the surface active elements uh, enhance the um, well depth of penetration and reduces the weld width if we use the optimum quantity of the surface active elements. But what is the in mathematical point of view how we can this phenomena represents in uh, true mathematical sense. So, uh, let, let us see that how it can be done. So, theoretically the so when we use some surface active elements within the metal or during the welding process. So, here you can see that uh, temperature coefficients of the surface tension is plotted like that either it can be negative or reaches some optimum point uh, or maybe it, it following the negative slope. So, that means in the if you see in the first figure that uh, temperature coefficient of the surface tension basically over this graph the gradient is greater than 0 that means positive slope reaching towards the optimum point and then gradually decreasing. And then that uh, other way also uh, decreasing, but this this generally happens in case of uh, when uh, the in presence of surface active elements for example, that sulphur presence in the steel that creates this kind of profile of the temperature coefficient of the surface uh, and other cases when we consider the pure element without any surface active elements, they generally flow this negative slope and that is the representation of the coefficient of the surface uh, um, uh, coefficient coefficients of the surface tension as a function of the surface active elements. So, let us see that basically this modify the uh, shear stress on the on the top surface of the oil pool that means, at the interface between the liquid medium and the uh, gaseous medium. So, that shear stress can be represented by this uh, d sigma by d x that can be represented the by in as a function of temperature and d t by d x. That means, is the temperature this first one is called temperature coefficients of the surface tension and this is the temperature gradient. So, by multiplying these two we can represent the what is the uh, shear stress value on the surface. So, that means, in presence of surface active elements actually modify the uh, shear stress value co considering these two term either modifying the temperature gradient or either modifying the coefficient of the surface tensor. But if we assume that in a specific oiling system the temperature gradient is uh, same, but there may be the variation of the coefficients of the surface tension that can be a function of the surface active elements. For example, here sulphur or maybe some other surface active elements that actually modify this uh, this uh, this term uh, so that is that can be either negative or positive in the sense that if you look into this figure and uh, this is always a uh, temperature gradient is always negative. So, if it is positive or negative depending upon there is a change of the sign that means, uh, shear stress or Marangoni shear stress actually acting depending upon the what sign convention we used for the coefficients of the temperature gradient. For example, if you look into this uh, it is a pure iron that means, uh, without any surface active elements the shear stress is basically acting from center to outward periphery. So, direction is given and that shear stress is basically be because of the shear stress the flow pattern normally happens from center to the outward periphery maybe we can say that it is the um, clockwise direction and uh, when, uh, but this clockwise direction we follow when the this temperature coefficient of surface tension is negative. That means, we say for this negative slope this is the situation. Now, if temperature coefficient of surface tension is positive then shear stress is basically acting the other direction. So, that Marangoni shear stress is 
uh, since it is acting towards the center of the oil pool that actually drive the liquid molten pool uh, from outward periphery to the inward direction. This basically completely uh, reversal of the flow direction happens in presence of the surface active elements that is this is the system for the iron and along with the pure iron along with the presence of the any surface active elements and this way it modify the direction of the flow pattern here it is looks like that it is a metal flow actually happens or the flow field is in a anti clockwise uh, direction. So, the in the very simply simplified way to incorporate the effect of the surface active elements in the simulation process we can use uh, this uh, this value that uh, coefficients of the temperature gradient this modifying this value that means whether it is positive or negative that means whether positive slope and the negative slope based on that that actually impact on the material flow pattern and we get we can get uh, either positive or negative value to different uh, flow pattern one is clockwise direction another anti clockwise direction and of course, we can see that if flow pattern is in this way that means anti clockwise direction that actually enhance the oil pool depth, but uh, the it actually reduces the width in other way also in case of pure iron that means in absence of any surface active elements that actually uh, modify uh, the flow pattern in such way that it actually the low depth of penetration, but with this very high. So, that is the typical impact of the surface active elements and we can represent mathematically in this way. Now, we will try to see that the heat transfer in general the heat transfer fluid flow or how it happens in the uh, small oil pool. Here uh, to explain the effect of the surface active elements experimentally it was observed that as a in a laser spot welding there are uh, two uh, picture that actually represents the oil dimension that means oil width and the oil depth of penetration and the first case it has been used that 20 ppm sulfur uh, uh, I think uh, this is for the material is the high speed steel. So, in high speed steel 20 ppm sulfur we mixed up uh, presence of 20 ppm sulfur this actually produce the this kind of profile that means depth of penetration is not by or aspect is, is very low width is very high and depth of penetration is low. But in presence of 150, 150 ppm sulfur that in the for the similar, similar material and the similar welding conditions that means similar power laser power and all other uh, laser spot diameter in all the cases there is a drastic change in the oil pool profile we can see that here in this case the penetration depth is very high and width is low. Although for the same material same welding condition only difference is the one cases is having low amount of the sulfur presence another cases is the relatively more amount of the sulfur uh, presence in the uh, second case and that that means experimental it is also observed that there is a uh, tremendous effect of the presence of the surface active elements that actually influence the material flow pattern and finally, it actually changes the oil pool geometry. So, therefore, it is very important to analyze the significant effect of the surface active elements most of the cases we generally neglect or we overlook the presence of the surface active elements in the oil pool. But in computational mechanics point of view how we can do the simulation here also we can see that a laser spot welding that similar conditions we have tried to do some simulation. And here we can see the full flow pattern in case of the low sulfur content this is the profile and and here the in, in this profile we can see that the material flow pattern is in this way that means uh, an other case uh, if we see that uh, when there is a presence of the surface activity means the material flow pattern is in this direction and in this direction. So, in these two cases although similar welding conditions, but there is a significant difference of in the oil pool shape, oil pool shape and size because of the presence of the surface active elements within the material itself. But when you try to do the simulation uh, this uh, material flow and then we need to consider the positive or negative value of the uh, 
uh, coefficients of the surface tension that we just we had discussed and by changing this value and we can uh, or changing the sign of the coefficients of the surface tension that actually able to incorporate the effect of the metal flow pattern and finally, it will be able to predict the uh, oil pool shape and size in when you do the uh, thermo fluid analysis uh, in case of the welding process. But this kind of phenomena not possible to capture when you do the simple heat conduction analysis in welding process. So, here the importance of the metal flow consideration in case of the uh, uh, oil pool simulation that means, temperature field as well as uh, fluid flow field uh, in fusion welding process. We have done some experimental also and we can see that not on the earlier case we, we can uh, we can see that in case of the laser welding and the, uh, the surface active elements actually present in the within the material itself. Now, there is the other way also the in case of T welding, but modifying the T welding process that is called activated T welding process or tungsten inert gas welding process. So, in this case also normal T welding process this is the surface tension uh, gradient uh, on this and here if the gradient is like this that means, negative gradient then flow pattern can be like this that means, metal flow from center to outward periphery and that actually brings the wide depth and low penetration, but other way in a tick process. So, that means, activated tick that means, if by any means if it is possible to add some surface active elements within the base material in the different way either the surface active elements is already present in the base material this is the one way or we can add the this active elements uh, by putting some uh, on the surface by putting some coating uh, of the surface active elements or if we it is possible to mix the that elements uh, within the shielding gas also and the by these three means it is possible to incorporate the uh, surface active elements to the uh, oil zone and then there is a that called is the activated T welding process. So, in that case it simply changes the slope of the surface tension gradient and that actually brings this kind of profile that means low width and the high depth of penetration. Let us see that in the first figure that is one way the surface active elements in T welding or gas tungsten arc welding process. So, in this process it is possible to mix the flux powder and uh, that flux after mixing this thing with the acetone mixing with the simply put the coating on the surface and then if we conduct the welding process we can find out there is a different profile although with the for the um, uh, similar parameters or maybe if we change the other parameters. So, this is the one way to add the surface active elements within the oil. So, experiments were conducted you can see that the T i O 2, uh, S i O 2, A L 2 O 3 all, all can be uh, used and then all these three uh, flux are used actually added and make some coating on these things. And we can find out uh, there is a, a difference in the oil pool profile. So, here simply that uh, if optimum quantity of surface active elements is added then actually it creates the uh, oil uh, mm, the from center points to the uh, outward periphery uh, with the presence of the mm, uh, in, in case presence of A L 2 O 3, but this from center to the outward of periphery when the it is happening the liquid metal flow from this direction that actually indicates that. Uh, there, there is no effect of the surface active elements here. That means, it is not necessary uh, all the surface active elements and any quantity actually always enhance the oil penetration and reduces the uh, oil width. Uh, not like that, there is a uh, optimum quantity is required first thing and second thing is that that surface active elements uh, that for example, Al 2 O 3, T i O 2, S i O 2. So, all oxides uh, may not act as a surface active elements during the welding process. For example, experimental have observed then in GTIW gas tungsten arc welding process and the surface active flux was used as Al 2 O 3 and we can find out that not there is a not increment of the 
uh, penetration actually. So, width actually increases and for this specific condition, but overall if we see that there is a uh, quantitative comparison uh, of the well uh, for example, well with dimension and aspect ratio with and without the flux corresponding to that. That aspect ratio uh, these two cases is moderately increased, but uh, with the aluminum Al 2 O 3 there is not much increment that means, it is not uh, uh, not effective as a surface active elements uh, during the welding process. But if we look into that uh, there is a TiO 2 flux here you can see and you can see there is a marginal improvement in the well bead uh, well, well penetration, but SiO 2 also you can see that also some marginal improvement that means with reduces and actually uh, depth of penetration in, uh, increases. So, in this case out of Al 2 O 3 TiO 2 and SiO 2 or this all these fluxes the TiO 2 is the most effective uh, active elements in the present system of the uh, welding that means, with the present conditions of the uh, welding. Now, we can see that also in the other way that effect of the surface structure elements in gas tanks are cooling process, but here just I mentioned the surface structure elements that means, presence of 4000 ppm oxygen and that oxygen has been mixed with the shielding gas that actually that actually acts as a surface active elements and that actually influence the uh, uh, material flow pattern in, in, during the welding process. Here you can see that it is a flow pattern is uh, in this direction uh, that material flow pattern is over that means, there is a effect of the surface active elements and then we can see that uh, even for the gas tanks arc welding process the it possible to achieve the quite high depth of penetration or that means, quite high aspect uh, a ratio. So, that means, as compared to the laser welding process, this is the other way that where it is possible to achieve the high depth of penetration just simply using some of the uh, active elements uh, adding to the uh, welding system that that uh, active elements can be added in terms of the flux and that flux can be put as a coating on the surface or already the active elements present in the base material all or this active elements can be added with, with the sealing gas. So, based on that we can find out there is a uh, profile. So, 3 ppm oxygen that actually produce this kind of profile of course, the amount of the oxygen presence in this case that actually decides not necessary that each and each a, this elements is too low that may not be effective to produce increase the depth of penetration even if it is too high then that is also not effective to produce the high depth of penetration. So, there is a optimum quantity is required uh, that optimum quantity actually we can get the optimum value that means, maximum value of the oil penetration in case of the uh, fusion welding process. So, therefore, if we look into that uh, GTA welding process experiments is generally carried out with the three different uh, flux layers and then we can find out the therefore, due to the Marangani convection of the surface active elements in the oil pool the oil bean dimension or may be changes are there may be significant we can possible to modify, but TiO 2 is the uh, most effective as compared to the um, other uh, other uh, surface active elements. But in case of Al 2 O 3 we did not find any kind of uh, this thing effect of the uh, active elements such that it will produce the high depth of penetration in this case in all in all this case possibly it is need to optimize the quantity or maybe it is need to optimize the uh, other process parameters. So, that we can get the benefit of the uh, active elements and uh, that actually influence the weight dimensions. Now, apart from the surface active elements and then how the presence of surface active elements actually uh, incorporated in some mathematical model, but just just by simplifying or just by modifying the coefficient of the surface tension value, we can incorporate the effect of the surface active elements. But of course, the platform is required to analyze both thermo fluid uh, analysis that means, mid, uh, heat transfer as well as the fluid flow analysis, then only we will be able to capture the effect of the surface active elements mathematically. Now, we will try to shift. Uh, that mechanical model that means, uh, thermo mechanical analysis which is widely used in the um, welding process. So, here if you see the mechanical model in the fusion welding process. So, we can say sometime thermo mechanical modeling. So, 
of course, in mechanical model is based on the solution of the three governing partial difference in equations of the force equilibrium uh, in tension notation. It is written that this is the governing equation that means stress with the body force or uh, unit volume I think and the uh, stress tensor they can make the equilibrium conditions and we if we try to solve this cases we will be able to find out this thing. But of course, the thermomechanical analysis uh, in, in general that there is a uh, after doing the thermal analysis. So, that temperature distribution actually considered as an input to the mechanical model and then we try to relate the constitutive relation between the stress and strain or between the strain and displacement. Then we will generally we uh, predict the distortion field or finally, the residual stress field in the welding process because in fusion welding or maybe other um, solid state welding processes it is important to predict at the final distortion level and the residual stress that is the mostly interested uh, mostly we generally interest to predict uh, that values. So, of course, when you try to use this uh, governing equation that in force equilibrium equation along with that some uh, boundary condition also that means, in, in terms of the displacement constant we generally put the uh, boundary condition that depend on the geometry and the body force in the form of the temperature. So, displacement constant in terms of the boundary conditions and, and at the same time the body force can be that uh, maybe we can say the load load to the uh, therm uh, thermo mechanical model that can be uh, estimated from the uh, temperature distribution. Here we normally we create the geometry and we can define this thing and within the geometry depending upon the practical welding condition we can put the constant displacement constant that means, uh, somewhere we are putting the clamp uh, and therefore, we put we need to put the dis displacement constant maybe uh, depending upon the direction we put the displacement 0 uh, in, in that specific direction or, or maybe on the symmetric surface. Uh, therefore, in the uh, normal to the symmetric surface displacement we put the displacement constant that means, displacement becomes 0. So, therefore, putting the boundary conditions in terms of the displacement and, uh, and that uh, and then solving the uh, governing equation assuming the uh, body force from the thermal load and, and finally, we solve the uh, displacement field in the in a thermomechanical analysis and this that displacement from that displacement field the strain field can be calculated and of course, from the strain field we can estimate the uh, stress value also. So, if we look into that uh, how the analysis of the stress and strain is generally done in case of the oiling process here you can see the temperature history first obtained from the thermal analysis and that actually acts as input to the structural analysis as a thermal loading. Therefore, each thermal load step and each because when you apply the thermal load step it is not the solution can be done exactly for the one single step. So, therefore, each thermal load step stresses are calculated from the temperature distribution and normally material uh, is material model in the sense that assume the follow the one Mrs. Hill criteria and the Pondel Ross flow rule. And of course, some uh, hardening behavior we need to predict, we need to define if we do the thermomechanical analysis. So, normally bilinear isotopic hardening uh, is used and then in the final form this is the equation between the stress and strain. So, uh, uh, the all the components of the stress uh, and here sigma and all other components is represented by strain and this the D is actually the properties material properties and uh, within the elastic limit if the relate between the stress and strain therefore, D should be related in the elastic properties of the material that means, uh, in the matrix form, but that elastic properties the Young's modulus and mainly the Poisson's ratio. And then normally we do the analysis assuming the material is the uh, material as a uh, not all elastic most of the cases we assume the uh, elastoplastic material. So, when the material is the elastoplastic is in nature then relation between the stress strain can be modified within the elastic limit the D matrix the D is you can say the elastic elasticity matrix or if it is in the plastic zone then D is can be the D elastoplastic matrix. So, then we need to incorporate the the plastic form what are the material properties you need to incorporate. We will see that how D can be represented 
the uh, in the uh, different way that means either in elastic analysis on the uh, plastic analysis but overall stress analysis is done uh, not in the in a single step even we consider the bilinear isotropic hardening that is a linear curve and it is possible to do the analysis the uh, mostly because elastic component is in linear comp uh, elastic components therefore the uh, elastic components is represented by the slope that means it's a linear path therefore in single step it is possible to consider the elastic uh, analysis but when you enter the plastic stage then the strain component is divided into smalls the in the incremental mode basically each an incremental mode that means we divide the total strain comp strain values in the very small component that means incremental d epsilon and that d epsilon consists of the all the three components uh, so thermal maybe if in welding process mainly the thermal load is here we uh, the thermal strain is generated so therefore this is the thermal strain incremental mode uh, plastic strain and the elastic component elastic strain component so that each and every increment we assume this thing then we update the stress value and the uh, distortion value as well as the strain value in each table but overall analysis for a long uh, overall duration of the um, load we divide into small small components uh, that means small small division uh, small small steps of the strain and then we do the analysis in the incremental mode that is the basic mode of the analysis then it is also important to know that how the displacement or strain is related so the displacement and strain field is related by this equation this is i think linear relation between the strain and the uh, displacement component but um, that is uh, that is called uh, the small displacement theory that means in this case normally we neglect the nonlinear term of the uh, distortion and then uh, we simply relate between the stress and strain by this way but of course in some cases when you try to capture the we specifically in very thin sheet when you try to capture the uh, local behavior in the zone in that case a large displacement theory is necessary to consider that means large displacement theory only component is the this component that is non linear component of the displacements also need to add such that uh, we will be able to capture the exactly the deformation behavior in specifically very small thin sheet and it is and which happens in a very locally localized zone and that is the either small displacement theory or large displacement theory we assume that and then based on that we simply relate between the uh, strain and the uh, displacement. So, once strain has been estimated and from the strain we can estimate the stress value also. But overall one misses criteria when you try to follow the one misses ill criteria then that one effective stress uh, uh, or maybe you can say the average value in one dimensional form can be uh, represents in the all the uh, three principal components the sigma 1, sigma 2 and sig sigma 3 all these three components principal components can be represent in one dimensional average stress value uh, that is that actually follow the one misses ill criteria Ill, Ill functional form this way also use in case of stress analysis. So, implementation in the finite element method that means how the stress analysis can be uh, considered in uh, when you try to do some develop using some finite element method. So, definitely first is point is that incremental mode we do the analysis in the incremental mode that means very small increment of the strain we do analysis and incremental stress can be represented like that d sigma equal to d and we, we can find out we say um, uh, expression for that and this actually represents the uh, thermal uh, related to the thermal uh, the thermal strain and uh, this uh, when you thermal strain and the el elasticity matrix then we represent that this is the thermal stress value. So, here we can see that incremental stress value is a consist of the three component this first component is related to the elasticity elastic part this component is the plastic part and this component is the thermal part. So, here you can see the d e actually represents the elasticity matrix and this we can see we can represent that d e p that means elastoplastic matrix and here uh, this is the uh, this component is the thermal stress value. So, that means the incremental mode since incremental total strength is consist of three components similarly incremental stress value can be the three components. So, of course, we generally follow the von Bessel criteria and the Pandel tools 
flow rates, but here delta f by delta sigma that actually consider the deviated stress component. So, when you try to estimate the uh, plastic component, we need to consider the uh, deviated stress component, we need to know the tangent modulus that means local slope of stress versus strain that actually local slope in the if you look into the elastoplastic matrix uh, plastic component um, that first component is the linear elastic and then it is a plastic in nature. So, therefore, this this part there is a continuous change of the slope. So, we need to consider that at any point at the incremental point this is the strain value and this is the stress value. So, this is the suppose this is the incremental point and here we need to consider the what is the slope and this slope actually changes. So, the tangent modulus actually changes. So, at any point we need to consider the slope local stress versus the uh, plastic strain that slope we need to consider to find out the elastoplastic matrix. And then final matrix in terms of the so, therefore, doing this and final matrix can be in the in terms of the steepness matrix k and d l is the incremental nodal displacement vector and d is the incremental equivalent nodal force due, due to the thermal stresses and d b is the incremental external force if any presence. So, if there is no external load presence then it simply becomes 0 that means, we finally, we represent the equation in the form of the a x equal to b in the matrix form that means, in terms of the stiffness matrix and we solve this stiffness matrix, we will be able to find out the incremental value of the um, displacement, nodal displacement. So, once we find out the incremental value of the nodal displacement, that displacement field uh, again converted to in terms of the strain component and then once estimating the strain component, that strain component can be can be converted to the uh, stress value. So, there in that way, we will be able to find out at any point of time, at any stage what is the value of the displacement, what is the value of the strain and what is the value of the stress or uh, finally, we, uh, once we know the stress distribution uh, or if you know the principal stress component sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, then we will be able to find out the bond misses yield function um, that means, average stress value uh, following the bond misses yield functional form. So, that all calculation are linked with respect to each other and we can find out in this way uh, the uh, strain field and strain field simply by predicting the displacement field in case of the simulation. But uh, after doing this to know some idea about the um, different types of the distortion we can see that the transverse sinkage this is the one type of the distortion we generally follow in, in, in welding processes and we can find out this is the transverse sinkage. So, this actually represents the welding direction and, and the uh, transverse sinkage that means no, uh, normal to that uh, transverse direction there is a sinkage of the metals happen that is called the transverse sinkage. Then longitudinal sinkage, so uh, uh, with respect to normal to the longitudinal direction, there is a longitudinal section, then there may be angular changes in case of T joint after welding process and rotational distortion can also be find out in welding process and then longitudinal bending we can observe after the welding process and finally, if sheet is very thin we can mostly we can find out the uh, buckling of this thing. So, so, these are the different pattern of the distortion generally we observe during the uh, welding process, but how we can predict these things. But here you can see that uh, how we can that is a serious problem in case welding process that to eliminate the uh, distortion. Anyway, the during the welding process and after finishing the welding process is uh, considerably change in the phase transformation microstructural changes also happen and that uh, happens under the some. Uh, mechanical constraints all actually responsible to produce the some amount of the distortion and the residuals in the final oil joint. But therefore, it is concerned how to control the uh, distortion in case of the oiling process or how to avoid that. Although it is not possible to completely avoid the distortion, but we can uh, follow proper simple methodology such that distortion can be reduced. So, one is the preset members to counteract distortion. So, before doing the welding process we can preset the members if we know the which direction distortion will occurs. So, based on that so if we presetting the members uh, simply to counteract the distortion that is possible. The second fixture to clamp workpiece in proper position we can put the certain fixture in the proper position to avoid any kind of the distortion. Other is the restraint reduces the distortion, but at the same time when you put the some restraints definitely it will reduce, but at the same time it will try to increase the amount of the residual strain. So, therefore, you should be very careful to uh, apply any kind of the mechanical restraints or uh, to avoid the uh, to reduce the distortion or that actually in increases the residual stress. So, most of the cases after doing the welding process 
we generally do the heat treatment such that the uh, properties up to certain extent the it, it can be recovered that means, we can reduce the distortion, we can reduce the amount of the residual stress that is the normal procedure to do the heat treatment uh, simply um, to recover the certain properties in case of the fusion rolling process. But normally what are the factors that actually affecting the distortion first is the uh, one is the one factor is the uniformly loading heated and cold, but in welding there is a it is a non uniform heating and non uniform cooling actually happens in the welding process that actually creates the distortion. For if you try to uh, create the mostly uniformly heating and the cooling process in case of welding that actually reduce the amount of the distortion. Second uh, other factors are the uh, welding locally heats a component. So, one specific component we just local, locally heat and therefore, adjacent part is the cold. So, therefore, heat difference in the or there is a uh, huge temperature gradient exists between the two parts of the component that actually brings the some amount of the uh, distortion. So, therefore, free heating sometimes helps to actually uh, minimize the uh, distortion. Other factors uh, affecting the distortion is the amount of the restraint up to what extent the flexible restraint whether we are using or very rigid restraints we are using that actually dip, that actually uh, influence the amount of the distortion in case of the oiling process. Then oiling procedure, oiling procedure in the sense that what type of the heat source, what is the typical geometric shape and size and the material properties uh, that actually used during the oiling process that is also responsible then the oil joint design with the bar joint, lap joint, T joint that actually this thing and the gap between the two components all actually influence the. Uh, influencing factor that actually generate the distortion in case of the oiling process. So, therefore, one is the restraint uh, putting the restraint normally to minimize the uh, distortion. So, therefore, components welded without any external restraints if you do not put any restraints are free from to move the distort the in respect of the in uh, distort in response to the stress from welding process that is the uh, one case. Therefore, clamping components Therefore, this restraint does result in the higher residual stress in the components. If we put the clamping components that actually try to produce the high amount of the residual stress. So, there are uh, in welding process not only the welding process. So, how we are using the surrounding medium fixturing, uh, fixturing or fixturing uh, not only the fixturing and uh, the material of the fixturing of the high conductive low conductive material that actually also influence the amount of the stress uh, that actually influence the uh, rate of the cooling. Uh, so, that finally, cooling rate influence the amount of the residual stress generation, but some idea about the measurement of the basic idea measurement of the residual stress normally we know that non destructive techniques normally we use the x ray diffraction or Newton diffraction. So, both use on the a similar kind of the principle, but x ray diffraction the limitation is the x using the x ray diffraction method we can use we can generally measure the residual stress only on the surface that means, maximum depth of around point uh, 0.05 millimeter. So, that means, 50 micrometer this is a very less. So, normally you can say on the surface we can using the x ray diffraction we can use measure the residual stress on the surface, but uh, Newton diffraction it can measure the up to certain depth may be up to 30 centimeter depth it is possible to measure the residual stress. But if we want to measure the residual stress using the x ray diffraction to at very high depth then it is possible to remove the top of the layer once we measure the residual stress from top surface then we need to remove that layer. Then after that we put the similar technology we put the again x ray diffraction method follow for the next layer of the surface to measure the residual stress, but Newton diffraction is not such limitation is not there. It can go up to very high depth of penetration we can measure the residual stress. So, it follows the uh, Bragg's principle that lambda equal to 2 d sin theta here if you see the theta is the scattering angle and d the interplanar spacing and lambda is the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. So, therefore, the strain is measured by changing in terms of the d. So, delta d by d actually that actually measure the uh, change in the, uh, this thing. So, x ray diffraction is the well uh, method to measure the residual stress. Other semi destructive method and or and fully destructive techniques that can also be used the hole drilling method uh, and, and other these the ring uh, coring crack compliances, contour method, slitting method, uh, slitting 
sectioning method and of course, these are the other typical type of the uh, uh, semi destructive uh, uh, residual stress measuring uh, unit, but all actually follow the principle of the strain uh, stress relief and then of course, this whole drilling method all this kind of method is we just if we put the using the simple strain gauge using the uh, very high sensitive strain gauge if we use it uh, using this and then it is captured the amount of the strain changes when there is a relief of the stress and based on that we can find measure the amount of the residual stress. These methods are considered the semi destructive because if the measurements are limited to only one point of the structure and therefore, that can be repaired very quickly. So, these are the typical methodology for the or basic principle for the measurement of the residual stress. But one important uh, thing is the in uh, uh, analysis or maybe uh, direction of the work in, in case of the welding process that is the measurement of the residual stress and how to reduce the residual stress because residual stress actually impact of the uh, life life of the weld joint. Therefore, it is necessary to very important to uh, assess the amount of the residual stress in gen basically generated during the welding process. So, uh, reducing the residual stress some simple or methodology is that selecting the appropriate processes therefore, certain processes we need to select the welding processes some procedures followed and sequence of the welding and fixturing. If you use the proper way we can reduce the uh, residual stress generation during the welding process. Selecting the best method for uh, stress relieving and the uh, removing distortion. So, stress relief and the removing distortion we need to consider the best method. Therefore, selecting design detail and the material to minimize the effect of the residual stress. These are the basic principle of to reduce the residual stress, but what are the techniques for the minimize the dist uh, distortion and residual stress is the welding fixture to physically distant parts, heat sinks to rapidly remove the heat. It is possible to rapidly remove the heat therefore, we can use the heat sinks also that actually reduce the distortion or maybe high conductive fixture material also we can use it that actually reduce the uh, uh, that actually quickly rapidly remove the heat. Tack welding at multi we can put the tack at multiple points along the joint to create the resist structure before the seam welding that actually minimize the distortion free heating the base part and finally, the stress relief of the heat treatment process that actually of the weld assembly this is the most general method to reduce the amount of the distortion and residual stress simply doing the heat treatment of welding process. And now, we will try to see some distortion field simulation uh, and we can uh, in microplasma welding process. So, here you can see that uh, distortion pattern of 500 micrometer uh, thickness sheet and here I think in microplasma welding this has been welded and we, we try to predict the uh, distortion field. So, here you can see that one case is the distortion is not much flat pattern, uh, other cases it is uh, uh, bending uh, is more in the other cases. So, one case is that that means, my point is that the of course, irrespective of the magnitude of the maximum distortion amount the difference the maximum to minimum is one cases is less other cases it is uh, very high. So, in the first case it was considered that the small displacement theory that means, when you try to relate between the strain and the displacement uh, in that case we do not consider the nonlinear component of the displacement. So, in the first case and the second case we consider the local behavior that means, nonlinear uh, part of the distortion and that actually predict uh, more precisely the distribution of the distortion in case of the very thin sheet and that is the in case in the second case. So, therefore, the very thin sheet it is we should use the uh, large displacement theory to predict the displacement field and of course, in the other uh, laser welding process I think it is a laser welding process yes power 4.5 kilowatt and the speed for 41.7 uh, millimeter per second and spot size is point uh, uh, I think uh, not uh, spots 0 0.63 millimeter. And here you can see using the temperature dependent metal properties and bilinear isotopic hardening. the first case the residual equivalent displacement. Here you can see the displacement is mac maximum at the which point the heat source we move 
at the edge along the edge and the second case also residual equivalent strain amount also generated more or less that along the weld line. So, this way it is possible to predict th through the finite element based numerical model the amount of the the residual equivalent displacement and all the residual equivalent strain that means, single value of the displacement and single value of the uh, strain. Here you can see the uh, maximum strain amount is as if around 0 0.156 and residual displacement we can find out that uh, around uh, uh, I, I think uh, 0 0.3 millimeter. Similarly, in the laser spot welding also we can find out the uh, uh, for 1 kilowatt laser spot oiling, this is the simulation of the residual distortion. So, in the first case, the if you on time is 0 0.1 second, 1 second result is on, then we can find out the distortion, residual distortion is very small and it is confined into the very small area. But once the uh, is increases, that means laser on time is increases uh, up to 0 0.65 second, then we can find out the that residual distortion the area actually increasing through which the residual distortion we can observe. And of course, in this cases that one case is the residual stress and the equivalent plastic strain in the uh, two cases one is the at 0 0.15 second one kilowatt laser we can see the residual stress is basically confined as a, a small area uh, near about the uh, oil spot. In other cases we can equivalent plastic strain also confined is a very small area. We can see other also that uh, thermomechan analysis of the micro laser spot welding process. So, that material SS 304 stainless steel uh, here and two laser power 25 watt and 75 watt has been used and laser type continuous wave fiber and thickness is only 100 micrometer. So, in this case we can see in the residual displacement is actually confined it is a in it is a very small it is a spot welding it is a very small zone, but if we zoom it we can see that this, this is the uh, displacement of the residual stress here in the thing and here you can see uh, the two different uh, uh, I think here is the two different uh, cases. Mm. Similarly, equivalent residual stress we can find out that this is the distribution normally the residual stress distributed over a bigger zone as compared to the, uh, the residual uh, displacement. So, here you can see that first figure the residual stress distribution and the second is the equivalent plastic strain plus plastic strain is, is basically confined it is very small area. And of course, the maximum value is towards the uh, bottom side of this thing big scene it actually depends the uh, thick seat thickness and that because normally thickness direction the temperature uh, gradient is less um, and of course, at the at the same time what is the amount of the heat loss from the bottom surface that means, whether we using any uh, kind of uh, high conductive material from the bottom side based on that the location of the equivalent strain or residual strain maximum amount will be will vary depending upon that. So, this just want to uh, see that here you can see that what way um, that uh, residual stress is distributed. Uh, in case of the oiling process. So, that of course, this is this residual stress is, has been calculated once the after putting the heat input and then when you uh, heat input is not in this way that means, after solidification happens and when it come back to the room temperature. Then this is the permanent amount of the stress strain or distortion field is actually generated in the oiling process. These are the typical distribution. So, stress relieving of oil some significant points that uh, related to the acetal stress and distortion in welding process that preheating actually reduces the problem. So, before welding process if we preheat the sample that actually reduces the problem caused by the uh, uh, during the uh, welding process. Second is the heating can be done, but this preheating can be done uh, electrically in the furnace for the thin surface radiant lamp or maybe hot air blast. blast so, therefore, there are several way to actually practically uh, do the preheating, uh, because preheating sometimes reduces the amount of the uh, problem related to the uh, uh, oiling process. Then some other methods of stress relieving that means, pinning, hammering, surface rolling these are the typical other mechanical methods that actually remove the amount of the residual stress in the oiling process. So, in summary uh, for the whole uh, 
uh, the computational methods in case of the oiling processes we can see that the first we have disc described the different heat source model uh, depending on the type of the oiling process because heat source model is significant if we try to correctly predict the amount of the distortion and residual stress. So, in that sense correct representation of the heat source is important in the oiling simulation. So, therefore, and that representation of heat source actually depends on the two uh, points one is the, the geometric shape of the uh, heat source and, and second point is the distribution. So, based on that uh, different type of the heat source models has been developed to represent the different oiling processes. Next was estimation of the temperature distribution in the oil zone and the heat affected zone by solving the heat conduction. So, we have discussed using the simple the temperature distribution can be done by simply solving the heat conduction equation with the proper boundary conditions. Of course, incorporation of the fluid flow enhance the that means, more precision results of temperature distribution and the fluid flow uh, material flow is better represented if we consider the material fluid flow uh, in case of the oiling process as compared to the only the heat conduction analysis. And of course, surface active elements presence of the or effect of the surface active elements is better represented or better explained by incorporating by incorporating the fluid flow phenomena in the oil pool simulation. And couple, but point is that couple thermofluid analysis is definitely computationally very expensive. So, most of the cases we neglect the fluid flow analysis and we, we do only the heat conduction analysis. Then mechanical analysis predicts the distortion and the residual stress, uh, but mechanical analysis needs to be considered the temperature distribution as an input to predict the uh, distortion residual stress in case of the oiling process. Then of course, coupled thermomechanical analysis again is also computationally very expensive. And then cooling rate we can from this numerical model or data we, we do, we, if we know the temperature distribution. So, from that temperature distribution we can estimate the cooling rate and that cooling rate can be linked with the microstructure in, uh, in a oil rate, uh, oil rate structure. So, therefore, just simply calculating the cooling rate it is possible to predict the what are the microstructure presence in the oil rate joint. Then of course, uh, simulation is important or significant when, when there is a difficulty of doing uh, or to capture the phenomena simply by doing the experiment, because it is not possible to uh, capture all the phenomena that happens during the oiling process experimentally. So, here there is a need of the numerical simulation. For example, the experimental evidence of the material flow within the oil pool is very difficult to uh, do experimentally. So, therefore, uh, numerical simulation can be a recourse to uh, better understanding uh, of this uh, phenomenological behavior in case of the well put similar. So, with this, so thank you very much uh, for your kind attention.